Hi everybody and welcome to Now Men, the podcast on men, masculinities and gender equality. It's Stephen Burrell here and I'm coming to you from Boomerang Country. How are you, Sandy? Well, Stephen, I'm finding it a bit hard to maintain some equilibrium as the world turns upside down, really. But but of course, what we're experiencing here in the UK or for you in Australia or... Uh, in the US is, is there's nothing compared to what many other people are going through worldwide. I think we have to acknowledge that. But um, I mentioned at the start of the last episode that I was going to see Patty Smith here in Oxford, um, which I did, and it was great. And I'm just sort of trying to hold on to some words she sang from her great anthem, uh, People Have the Power. You know, the people have the power to redeem the work of fools, and the armies ceased advancing because the people had their ear. And as she said at the end, you know, use your voice. So that strikes me as quite a good counter to some of the hopelessness that that many of us feel at the moment. Uh, how are you? How are things with you, Stephen? Yeah, absolutely, Sandy. Those are really, really opposite words. Um, and I'm glad you enjoyed the gig. Um, yes, I'm well, thank you. Yes, it's uh, coming to the end of the semester here. I just taught my last uh, class yesterday. I teach a course called Contemporary Critical Criminology. And actually, one of the things we get the students to do, we, we talk a little bit about public criminology and, um, you know, what it means as academics to try and um, have an impact on broader society. So when we actually use the podcast as an example and talk about that in class which and so actually the the students we ask the students to listen to an episode so i hope they don't mind that too much and maybe some of them are even listening to this <laughs> but yes uh, i'm very excited that today we have with us uh, rob oaken and he's perhaps best known for being the editor and publisher of voicemail magazine between 1996 and 2023 Um, He's a former executive director of the Men's Resource Centre for Change, which was one of the earliest men's centres in North America. Yes, and Rob's also the editor of an excellent book, Voicemail, The Untold Story of the Pro-Feminist Men's Movement. And he continues to speak at colleges and universities around the US and writes for newspapers and websites such as Ms. Magazine about issues such as gender in American politics, which is, of course, very timely. So, so hi, Rob. It's a privilege to have you with us today. I'm delighted to be here. Oh, we, we know you've got family in North Carolina, which has been impacted terribly, along with several other states, by Hurricane Elaine in the last week. And we're recording just before Hurricane Milton hits the Florida Peninsula. So, so we hope that everyone, including your family, is, is, is doing okay. But it looks like the hurricane has been really devastating. Yes. Um, thank, thank you for asking about that because we all, you know, the news just is like this tsunami of news coming at us all the time. And oftentimes we're hearing about the tragedies someplace far away from us. And our hearts go out and then we go about our, our day or we make a financial contribution or we do something, um, even if it's just enough to acknowledge the our shared humanity and the suffering that some people are going through. But it's of another order when you're in the line of the destructive forces that nature can can bring. And in this case... Uh, my one of our daughters, sons-in-laws, and two of our grandchildren were all in the city of Asheville, which was right in the heart of where the flooding was. And fortunately, their house was spared, and they were uh, all safe and got involved in helping out in their community. Um, the kids in the neighborhood, the older kids, mine are eleven and nine. They were helping take care of the younger ones. They set up a community kitchen. There was a real sense of uh, solidarity. And that's the, the people that have been helping. My daughter's a nurse and was going to the shelters doing wellness checks. My son-in-law was getting uh, trees off of houses and cutting them up with a chainsaw. So everybody is is putting their shoulder to the wheel. And then you those of us on the outside, you know, family are are feeling the concern about what's going to happen, when will the water go back on, when will the schools open again. But we take a step back and we go, this is the climate emergency right now in our face, in our family. The wildfires in Northern California People that we know out there, would they talk to us? We take it in, but the emergency—it's—it's it's, the, the sirens are blaring, and 
in terms of what else we're going to be speaking about uh, on this podcast, the challenges of solving the climate emergency, the climate catastrophe, the challenges have been made all the more difficult, uh, I think, and I'm, I'm not alone in the reality that many of the male leaders, often white, have demonstrated a tremendous reluctance to acknowledge reality. And there's kind of a blind stubbornness to protect the old order and not take in uh, the truth. And there's something that resonates with the kind of uh, old style expression of, of manhood that men know best, we're in charge, we're going to just plow through, we're not going to listen. And I think some of those traits have contributed to our lagging behind where, where we might have been if we had been really listening to the truth and the science. Mm -hmm. And it's no accident that many of the, the leaders of the movement, uh, not exclusively, but that are, are, are women. And I think the leadership that a young uh, Greta Thunberg has demonstrated in, in Sweden, that, that there's, a, there's, there's a connection between how the world turns and how it's really time for, for us to take a step back. And that's why I think mm. the U.S. election and the prospects of, of electing the first female yeah. president, let alone the first uh, woman of color, uh, are, are so important, not just symbolically, but it's really time for us to take a step back as men. So you're talking there, Rob, about uh, the US having the potential to elect the first ever woman, not to mention the first woman of color as the country's president. And, and how significant does that feel to you? It's, it's really huge. Um, there's been such an... Uh, a feeling of hopefulness and possibility since the whole landscape of the presidential race dramatically changed uh, the third week of July when President Biden dropped out. And he's to be credited for making that decision, even though it took him a while to come to it. <laughs> um, but the sense of hopefulness and the excitement that started to build was really reminiscent of how people felt when uh, Barack Obama came on the scene, that there's something shifting, there's something uh, exciting. And it certainly isn't that all of her policies or her, her proposals for policies are, you know, the most progressive um, in many ways, you know, the jury is out until she doesn't have to totally administration line. After all, she's the vice president. She's not the president. So there's hopefulness that she's going to, uh, you know, take on a, a progressive agenda. And she certainly will be doing that on reproductive rights and certainly will be continuing uh, some of the gains that have been made in, in uh, the climate catastrophe. And hopefully, you know, we have a lot to do, a lot of work in this country with the judicial system, with the Supreme Court being uh, supremely biased and bigoted to six of the nine, the, the three, three of the four women on the court are, are terrific. So we're, we're, we're excited. We're working hard. Um, there's an expression, all gas, no brakes between now and the next month, because everything just came on. Uh, I've been writing a lot about this. I, you probably saw some of those pieces I did for Ms. Magazine. Uh, if, you, if you're going to some segments of the U.S. Pop male population, you see some futility that there's a lot of old school uh, Trump supporting, let's go back to the 1950s. But there's also a lot of work being done by uh, millennial men and, 
in Gen X men that are telling a different story. And I actually think when this election is done and the, the voting demographics are delved into that we're going to find that there was a larger cohort of men supporting reproductive rights and voting for Vice President Harris because of that. You know, there's so many groups in the, in the U.S., so many progressive activists, men's groups from, um, you know, Equimundo and the Men Engage Alliance and the different organizations, the work of, you know, colleagues like um, North America Men Engage. But the most exciting organization for me in this time right now is one called Men for Choice with the numeral four in the middle, men for choice, laser focused, one issue. They're, they, they may personally believe in all the other things that we've been working on all these years from preventing domestic and sexual violence and working on men's health and engaged fathering. But they just say, we're going to do one issue and one issue only, and that is getting men to step up for reproductive rights and they are so skilled at it they have trainings three times a year where they work with this young men in the 18 to 30 uh, age group and they train them to go out and be ambassadors for reproductive rights and that they make the case that um, this is your issue, that the days of calling this a, a women's issue are long gone. We're, we're, we're so pleased that the, the second gentleman, uh, Vice President Harris's husband, Doug Emhoff, has been speaking out regularly for reproductive rights. He's worked specifically with this organization, Men for Choice. And I, I just see that there's a lot of uh, uh, comfort comfortableness that, ooh, this isn't our issue, this isn't, I don't deliver babies, I can't get pregnant. You know, this is, a, this is as much an issue if we care about our, our partners, for those who have wives or daughters or sisters or aunts, this is critical that men are in the game. And I know that in a lot of mm. uh, Western countries that men are showing up more for this issue. Uh, because we're, it, it's like a secret you know, weapon that there's half of the population is on the sidelines. And if men step up for this issue, it's, it's going to be uh, huge. Mm. Yes, I mean, it's not like um, men aren't affected by <laughs> reproductive rights as well, right? And how we benefit from uh, access to abortion as well. Um, but um, yeah, well, I wanted to... to go back to something you talked about there about this kind of debate about the kind of gendered polarization or kind of gendered split in in voting in the US at the moment. Um, this idea that men are more likely to vote Republican, women more likely to vote Democrat, and, and perhaps that that's even manifesting itself to some extent among young people. But it seems like you're suggesting actually the picture is a lot more complex than that. Um, and we know, for example, you've been involved in a group called White Dudes for Kamala. Um, so yeah, could you perhaps tell us tell us a bit more about that initiative and um, you know how you feel about this idea of polarization? That it, I mean, yeah, clearly the picture does vary actually depending on which groups of men we're talking about, right? Presumably, in terms of where they're living, what their age is, what their race is, and so on and so forth. Right. You know, this is this is it is complicated because the demographics of who's up, who has privilege and power. You know, we know that as as a gender. If we if we arrive on the planet in male identified bodies, that we we've got a leg up. We've got the the prospects of having some entitlement. But of course, there's a lot of men who, you know, and this isn't just men of color. It's there's plenty of men who are white men who are uh, not feeling any of the gains of the economic, you know, the profits that are being made by the big corporations, the male workers on the line are not seeing any of that. So there's a lot of uh, frustration, uh, 
disgruntlement and and in, in some cases hostility towards thems that are doing well at their expense. So it's easy for those men to be uh, picked off by the the right wing influencers on social media, the what's referred to nowadays as the manosphere, and they can get their positions bolstered by the politics of grievance. Uh, but if you listen to them, if, if you're really willing to take in that, that they are struggling and show some empathy for them and describe some of the things that they could do to improve their situation and that there's some solidarity with them, like, you know, coal miners uh, reinventing themselves as solar technicians, for instance. Um, the, a colleague in, in, in Washington named Andrew Yarrow wrote a book uh, about five years ago called Man Out, Men on the S Sidelines of American Life, in which he empathetically profiled this cohort of, of men who really do feel on the outs and they are susceptible to the kind of bluster and bravado and old school expression of masculinity. So, you know, that's a, that's a warning sign. And I think it's, it, it will be important for uh, uh, an administration, if it's uh, Vice President Harris and Governor Walls, to really take those men's situations to heart and to look at that's a that's a, another secret weapon as a workforce to, to to do these new green jobs that we really need in the U.S. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, and um, well, going back to what you were saying, really, I mean, it's clear that. Um, Candidates on both sides actually uh, are appealing to ideas about masculinity in a bid to win voters over, and perhaps especially men. But actually, people of all genders, as we know, gender has a huge impact on how we perceive politicians, and you've written a lot about that as well. Um, yeah, could you perhaps tell us a bit more about that, about um, how that's manifesting? How, um, well, I mean, I think for example, it's quite clear about how Trump and Vance that they're using certain very masculinist ideas and very traditional ideas about the family. And, and masculinity in a bid perhaps to, to appeal to some of the grievances you were talking about. Um, but there's interesting stuff going on there with the Democrats as well. Yeah, could you perhaps talk a bit more about that, about how ideas about masculinity are being used to try and win over voters? Sure. I, you know, I think that the strategy that, that, the, that Trump took, and it, it's in part why he chose someone like Vance, who's so unqualified, He's only been in the United States Senate for less than two years, and he only got there because the billionaire Peter Thiel's funded his campaign to the tunes of tens of millions of dollars. Uh, and his positions on everything are so old school, you'd be surprised to think that how can this guy just be just having had his 40th birthday this summer? Um, but their strategy was to run, you know, to the far, hard right and go back, go backwards into the 1950s. And it was a strategy that only was uh, set up in terms of running against Biden. And suddenly, you know, the, the Republican, if I can just back up for a second, the Republican convention was s such a... Uh, spectacle with the theme song being It's a Man's World and the professional wrestler Hulk Hogan ripping off his shirt. And it, and the, the whole thing is just all driven, you know, we're going to run, we're going to get all of these white, white male voters and we'll try to get some uh, men of other uh, racial categories to join in and support us when we're running against Joe Biden. And it was, th I didn't realize this until I looked it up. It was three days after the convention that Biden dropped out and suddenly it's a gendered 
uh, election here, you're now running against a woman. And those ideas are not going to play so well in your strategy. And I don't think to this day that he's ever recovered. He, Trump still goes on these unhinged rants. You know, it was a coup. I want to run against Joe. What? They, 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 they pushed him out. That was my guy. The U.S. is, is such a skewered place um, because clearly we are, it, by population, a center-left country. But because of our uh, archaic, unfair way of electing presidents, this, this thing that some people may be familiar with called the Electoral College, it disadvantages the, the majority. But the truth is, on all of these issues, whether it's voting rights or the climate or reproductive rights, the, the percentages all, the, the, this country is more progressive than it's been allowed to be because of that system. All the elections, except, except George Bush's second election in 2004, all the elections going back 20, 30 years, the popular vote was always won by the Democrat. Always. In 2000, the, the contested election where Al Gore, who went on maybe to the world's better benefit that he became such a uh, advocate for the climate, he won by a half a million votes. Hillary Clinton won by just shy of, of uh, three million votes. And, and in his victory, Biden swamped Trump by more than 7 million votes. And I'm sure that it will be that much or more for for Kamala Harris. So m meanwhile, the, the, the engine of the of culture change is, is chugging along. And young men, some of whom uh, are feeling uh, a little bit confused and, and left out and more women are getting into medical school and going to law school and into the professions. And there is some uh, bewilderment that, wait a minute, the world that I thought I was inheriting, I'm not inheriting it anymore. So I'm supposed to feel some grievance about it as opposed to, well, so what does this mean for my life? How am, how am I going to live? And the opportunities for men to see that their definition of manhood and masculinity is evolving. We're still in 2024, we're still socialized in, in large measure in many uh, environments. We're still socialized with that older school mentality of how gender is supposed to be. Pink is for girls and blue is for boys and all that bullshit. But the truth is, is that the chain, it, it's happening. There's a great turning going on. There's a transformation going on. And men slowly are catching on. I mean, we know for those of us who've been doing this work for a long time, that the numbers of men who identified with uh, the women's movement or with feminism uh, were much smaller you know, in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s than there are today. It's no longer uh, an, an abnormal sight to see a dad at the park with his kids in the middle of a work day, in the middle of the week. So the, there's progress has been made. The change is happening. And mm. It's like that expression that uh, Vice President Harris has been using, we're not going back. And we're not going back on all of these issues. And, you know, men can come along <laughs> stubbornly or they can come along uh, with open arms and open hearts. You mentioned a minute ago the role that uh, the second gentleman, Mr. Emhoff, is playing in um, Men for Choice. 
And, you know, there is something quite interesting happening on the Democrat side, as I think Stephen alluded to in his earlier question too, isn't there, that, you know, quite a bit has been made of the, the so-called new masculinity of on the Democrat side. And I'm wondering if you wanted to say a bit more about that. And, you know, how new is that, really? You've been involved in the movement for, for many years. Right. And uh, it'd be interesting to know how, how new you think it is. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, like a lot of us who've been doing this work for a long time, we started, you know, to chuckle when the mainstream media started to describe, oh, there's this new expression of masculinity, you know, the, the men are like, they're showing up. There would have been a time where uh, a man would say, you know, I, I can't play second fiddle to you. You can't be the, the, the main person. The second gentleman or the first gentleman, that's unheard of. I can't do that. And now there's this sudden celebration that you know, Governor Walls can show, on the one hand, I can be uh, a football coach. Uh, and of course, we improperly use that term. We need to come up with a more uh, appropriate expression. We can't absolve ourselves by playing that that sport that isn't really football. <laughs> uh, but he can, on the one hand, be a coach. And on the other hand, be an advisor to the gay straight alliance in the same high school, hmm. and, the, and that in, in, in a phrase, if the power went out and the and the podcast was over, I'd want people to think about that. That the so-called new masculinity is the integration of those um, traits within one person. That you can be a coach on a rough and tumble sports team and have the same sensibility and sensitivity to be a support and a guide for people who are struggling with their uh, sexual orientation. And the fact that those of us who've been involved in this work for a long time saw that this was beginning to happen 50 years ago, and it was growing 40 years ago, and it was growing 30 years ago and 20 years ago, that suddenly the media is picking up on this and calling it new. I mean, it's laughable on the one hand, but it's terrific on the other. I don't remember who I was talking to, but can you believe that the presidential campaign is suddenly giving a lot of, uh, I am gesturing with my hands raised, you know, the, the, all this uplift to the work that we've been doing. This has been a great, acceleration of the of the movement and then to be able to yeah. to share with some of these people oh yeah here here's a just to, you know on a personal note here's a magazine that's been publishing articles about this idea of redefining manhood transforming masculinity for decades yeah um, here, here's all the films here's all the books this is a, a movement that has some real scholarship and some real activist roots behind it and uh, educational seminars, and it's international. People are completely blown away when they learn about the sc scale and scope of the Global Men Engage Alliance, that it's operating in 80, 90 countries and has, you know, member groups all over, you know, near nearly every continent. So the new masculinity, I'm really not attached to how our voice has gotten elevated. I'm just delighted that it has. And that uh, Doug Emhoff as the second gentleman and Tim Walls as the vice presidential candidate are in some ways are embodying it and are standing there in contrast to Donald Trump and J.D. Vance and the craziness that comes out of, of their mouths. J.D. Vance's position on, you know, women in a domestic abusive situation should stay in the marriage. I mean, not everybody's going to get there, and they're not only going to get there by uh, next month in the elections here in the U.S., but... 
Like the song says, a change is going to come. Okay, let's move on now to discussing a bit more about the pro-feminist men's movement in the United States. As we mentioned earlier, you've been involved in this movement for around 40 years now, Rob. So how and why did you get involved in the first place? Um, can you say a bit about what impact feminism has had on you and on your life as a man? Yeah, it's interesting that uh, I often say that there's many ways that one can enter the portal of, uh, of men's work. Uh, and fatherhood for many men can be that portal and not all men, you know, are fathers. So um, that's not necessarily going to be the, the portal in, but uh, I think I'd been kind of dancing around the edges of thinking about feminism and men's relationship to feminism when I was in my twenties uh, and there was a lot of, uh, what was then described as feminist art in the in the U.S. in the women's movement, and that was uh, something I was interested in. And it, but it really everything accelerated once I did become a father, and that was that was coming up on forty years ago. So I think that noticing that the capacity to nurture, to have to take care of another being who was helpless and needed everything, just uh, cracked open my heart in a way that I hadn't uh, experienced before. And I probably was a, a caricature of a you know, involved dad, before the term politically correct, it was like, you know, I just felt it was critical to just live my life as a very involved parent. And I got to feel it was interesting or odd that the first experience of real discrimination that I felt as a man ever was being coming a father that I could be with a with a baby you know a few months old in the summertime at an outdoor cafe or something and the baby's mom had gone up to pick up the food and I'm sitting with the baby and this older woman who was waiting on us was just circling around didn't come over, just circling around looking. And then the second that um, mom came back, she was all over us with questions. And I was just like, you know, a door stopper. She didn't want anything to do with me. It was the experience of a woman and a man going into the hardware store. And the woman says, I'd like to buy a, a hammer or a tool. And the clerk looking directly at the man and answering you know, what, what size do you want, sir? So it, it just uh, created, I mean, this was the political and the personal coming together. God damn it, I'm going to be, you know, not just being involved, but I'm going to talk about it. You know, there was some U.S. politician who had a baby at the same time that my firstborn. And he publicly, proudly said, the baby was born in the morning and I was back at my desk at the office of budget and management in the afternoon going, dude, you're, you're nuts. You are missing out on, you get my point. So, so that was foundational to me, uh, becoming a father and finding that, that I didn't just want to have that capacity to be nurturing and, and compassionate and caring, but that, I loved it and I wasn't threatened if, you know, mom was having some successes in her work. I, it was like, this is, this is great. Economically, it wasn't so good because we were splitting half time working and half time taking care of little ones, but it, it really set me up for, um, 
you know, within a f handful of years, discovering that right in, uh, in the town that I lived, Amherst, Massachusetts, two hours west of, of Boston, a university community, that there was a small burgeoning men's center. And what was that all about? And I can't remember when it was in the early 90s, started to get connected. There were all kinds of things that they were offering monthly Sunday brunches for men to just get together and talk and just trying to figure out how to organize something as a, as a small nonprofit. It was called the Men's Resource Connection originally because the idea was helping men to get connected. And then it eventually evolved into a nonprofit organization, an actual center. We had a, a building and had support groups for men and a batter's intervention program for men who were either mandated or urged to go to deal with their abusive behavior. And then support group for gay men and a young men of color leadership group for high school kids and a women's program where women were working with the partners of men in the batterers program. And there was this tiny little newsletter that they had called Valley Men. And I hadn't shared this, but my first career uh, was as a journalist at a city newspaper in the city of Springfield, Massachusetts, about the second or third largest city in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And over the years before getting into men's work, I had edited a magazine about alternative energy and anti-nuclear politics and had stayed, kept my hand in the writing and editing world. And I looked at this little newsletter and I said, oh, this, there's nobody writing about what's going on in this movement. So over time, I became more involved in the organization and eventually was the associate director, um, great friend and colleagues, Stephen Botkin, who would be a great guest to have on sometime, um, who's been a leader in our movement for even longer than I've been involved. Um, I took on the responsibility of trying to nurture this little newsletter, Valley Men Along, and I had they had a uh, I coined this term for the letters to the editor section, voicemail, as if it was M A I L, and eventually said the name Valley Men that that that's got to go. Um, we managed to come out with a magazine that eventually was uh, four color on a good recycled glossy stock and had a good run of it. And uh, it was one of the most satisfying things that I did that I could look at any of the organizations in the US or around the world. And all I want to do is help to support and promote and give voice to the work that's going on. I was in the you know, spirit of all, all boats rise together. <clears throat> Voicemail could be a voice for our movement. And um, as I got more involved with, with Men Engage and started to go to some of the international uh, symposia, that's where Sandy and I met, um, Mm -hmm. I realized that the stories in the magazine could not just be a North American. And so some of the stories that I've appreciated the most are some of the encouraging work coming out of India or some of the African countries. And it's really exciting to think that the, the change that I was talking about earlier, this great transformation, the great turning, that it's right there. It's right there. The work is going on. Younger men are stepping up. 
all over the world. And uh, voicemail has its, its place. And I was so delighted when I could work things out with the Canadian NGO Next Gen Men, so aptly named Next Gen Men, who uh, any day now should be coming out with their first independently, independent of me, independently produced um, issue of mm -hmm. voicemail. They, they kept the name and I'm excited to see the first issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it's really an amazing contribution, I think, Rob. And um, I mean, to be honest, I think that's probably something we're trying to emulate with this with this podcast, right? That like perhaps this uh, now and men could almost be sort of podcast, you know, kind of uh, inf influenced very much by voicemail. And I think your book as well really powerfully chronicles like the history of this movement in the U.S. and beyond. Um, and I think one of the amazing things about the magazine is the kind of the incredible richness and diversity of issues that you focused on, like just in the U.S., let alone as you say with the international aspects as well. Um, yeah, I was just wondering if, if you had a one or two favorite features that you've been involved in over the course of the magazine that you, you perhaps wanted to mention. Yeah, I, I knew you were going to ask me that question. And it's like, you know, which child do you <laughs> like the best? Uh, <laughs> it's a tough question to answer. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I think, you know, some some of the first person accounts of men's awakening, uh, when a man who had been previously acting abusively in his relationship had that aha moment and started to, to change those kind of first person accounts. Um, and then when we started to do uh, coverage of work going on internationally, just to feel the excitement of, um, you know, being able to have an issue with stories from, as I said, from India or Bangladesh or, you know, different parts of, of Europe, uh, piece from Chile, uh, you know, just to be able to, to see that men were both wanting to change and were changing, and they were all uh, acknowledging, as I should have earlier in this uh, conversation, that none of the work that we are doing would have been possible had it not been for the women's movement and the leadership of women and the invitation to women uh, for men to get involved in this work. I, I often quote uh, Gloria Steinem, who famously said, women want a men's movement. We're literally dying for it. Um, and that was back in the time when women were saying to men's question, how do you want us to help? What do you want us to focus in on? And it wasn't at that, at that time reproductive rights or it wasn't about pay inequity or in, any other issue. It was the, the, the scourge of, of, of violence against women. So the earliest work really a lot of it focused on on violence prevention and batters intervention programs and men taking to heart that that call and then as time went on and we started to develop those alliances and relationships with women and women's organizations we were able to think about what other issues that we wanted to take on and I think one that, you know, is underrepresented and it was certainly we could have done a better job in voicemail um, that I think is really important is men's health, which because men neglect health, I mean, I'm generalizing, but the stats, the statistics bear it out that our ability to be, you know, the best that we can be as, as parents, as partners as uh, citizens, you know, we have to be healthy and I think in body, mind and spirit. So I'm hoping that uh, Next Gen's men's version of voicemail will include more attention to that issue. Mm -hmm. So we've gone from paying attention to violence against women and wanting to be supportive 
of the empowerment of women and girls to now recognizing that our own physical, mental, and spiritual health has to be attended to. And if anything, that um, reflects the last vestiges, the hold that old style masculinity has held on our movement is probably that too many of us have worked too long hours and neglected our health and you know, we got to do it for the cause. And I think it's really critical that mm -hmm. those of us in this work, especially if we want to stay in it for the long haul, that we take care of ourselves so that we can take care in the work itself. Mm. Has, that, has that got anything to do with you stepping back from uh, voicemail, Rob? You know, are you, you feeling you want to do less? Has standing back from voicemail opened up new territory for you? Yeah. There's certain things that you you take on that are not a job. They're they're not like something that you know you do your your decades of work and then you, they have the party and you get the gold watch or whatever. The tr transformation of masculinity that I've witnessed and been part of in the, in my lifetime, uh, stepping away from editing and publishing voicemail did not, does not mean that I'm stepping away from wanting to see this work continue. So I'm using my voice as a, as a writer to write these op-eds and I am part of a, a, a syndicated uh, group called Peace Voice that sends op-eds out, uh, commentaries they go out to several thousand editors of print and digital publications, and they wind up in the most wonderful middle size or smaller newspapers in states in the U.S. that you would never have thought would pick up uh, a story. They get them for free. So if it's well-written and well-reasoned and might stir a little bit of uh, controversy, Editors are happy to run something, even if it's outside of their own political comfort zone. So for me, writing those kinds of op-eds and getting them into papers in U.S. states like Ohio or you know West Virginia or Montana or Idaho, places where in other southern, southern states, um, that's very gratifying. And I'm going to continue to use my voice for that. <clears throat> and actually, before I got on with you, I was finishing, I was finishing a piece that I've tentatively headlined how men vote about abortion could determine who becomes the next president. And it's looking at those questions that we were addressing earlier uh, about the changing nature of men's relationship to the reproductive rights issue and the whole issue of bodily autonomy. There's a wonderful clip if, if uh, you could find on YouTube of then Senator Kamala Harris questioning Supreme Court Justice nominee Brett Kavanaugh, in which, with her background as a prosecutor, she said, can you tell me, are there any laws that you're aware of that control the male body? And to see this man squirm at being asked that question. <laughs> and of course, he said, uh, uh, none that I'm aware of, Senator. So, the possibility of seeing this uh, expansion of our work, the, what I see in how younger men, uh, in just in anecdotally in the circles of my friends, adult children, and my older grandchildren, to see the sensitivity and the compassion that that's there, and to see that the young people um, are not buying into the gender binary and that in one of my grandchildren's, uh, when they were in elementary school, 
a number of young people, both male identified or female identified, who just say, I'm using the pronouns they and them. Just the the change, the gender fluidity speaks to me in a way that uh, feels very hopeful about the capacity of, of people to grow and to change. And when my daughter told the third grade teacher that their son wanted to use the, the pronouns they and them, the teacher's response is, oh, they're not the first one in this class and they probably won't be the last. So there's a lot of topics like that and um, the change in how men are feeling about uh, reproductive rights as a and abortion care as, as a health issue and women's bodily autonomy means men's bodily autonomy. All those topics seem ripe for finding some way to make a contribution, to make a, a comment, to, to say something. As our former First Lady Michelle Obama said, to do something. Hmm. I'm wondering, I mean, I've just got a last thought for a question, which is, are, are there things that you think uh, you would like our listeners to do in the remaining days before the presidential vote on November the 5th? Um, well, my, my single uh, focus, and I'm at the end of the week on Sunday, I'm going to go down to uh, central North Carolina and work on the election. And I think if if there are people hearing this before uh, the November 5th uh, U.S. presidential election and they have any contact uh, influence on young men who are registered to vote or still have time to register to vote, to really ask them to look at the, the stark choices in the U.S. right now and to... Um, make the only rational decision to to put their shoulder to the wheel and to vote for a new beginning for our country with a woman as a president and a, and a compassionate dad as the vice president. So that's a very concrete act. But in general, uh, look for opportunities to mentor, support, encourage, younger men to find their hearts and keep them open and work for a world in which the gender landscape is not uh, one where women are being second-class citizens, where men can feel comfortable with women's leadership and women's empowerment and that we all are looking for an, a new opportunity for people to grow and to be as one. And maybe the time will come someday in the distant future where the gender construct won't be as central as it is now. Thank you so much, Robert. It's, it's such a pleasure to speak to you. Your, your optimism is infectious. And um, yeah, I'm so grateful for all the work you've done in, in kind of chronicling this movement and, and taking this movement forward. So, so yeah, thank you. And it's good to hear that you're going to carry on doing some of what you're doing because it uh, it really matters, as, as Stephen says. Mm. So thank you. Oh, this has been a wonderful opportunity to talk with two men who are making tremendous contributions of your own to this work and have been doing so for a while. So, you know, all hands on deck. <laughs> Absolutely. I really appreciated Indeed. the opportunity to be with you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, we really appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks. So that conversation really reminded me of a previous podcast we did, Stephen, uh, over a year ago with Jackson Katz. If you if you recall, yeah. you know he was talking about the context of the American election even back then and making mm. some similar points. But actually, his. Uh, his way of saying it was so different from Rob's. I mean, Rob, you know, Jackson is very, very forceful and straight and, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, Rob was much more sort of thoughtful and and softer and, 
you know, yeah. they, they both have their, their merits, I think, in, in terms mm. of exploring some of these issues. Absolutely. It shows different ways that men can approach this work, doesn't it? Because they're both from, well, they're both, I know they're both based in Massachusetts. They've both been around doing this work for similar lengths of time, I think. So, yeah, it's, it's fascinating. <laughs> mm. Well, the other thing that brings, brings them together right now, of course, is that uh, uh, Rob's just written an article about Jackson's film called mm. The Man Card, mm. which traces the history of, you know, how uh, masculinity has uh, appeared or been less visible, actually, but but still prominent mm-hmm. uh, in presidential campaigns and politics and so on and so mm. forth. And actually, it's worth saying that, you know, if, if people can get hold of The Man Card and have a, have a viewing of that, mm. uh, I'm sure that would be a real uh, nice combination with these podcasts that Mm, we've done mm, absolutely because i mean i think it's just so important isn't it to and we've talked about this in multiple episodes but how deeply present gender is within these political debates and contests you know i mean one example that comes to my mind is how the republicans were calling tim waltz tampon tim because of you know laws he'd introduced as as governor, um, as if like that was somehow a bad thing to be supporting uh, women and trans people's access to like menstrual health uh, products and and so on. Obviously, there's clearly something going on there in terms of trying to denigrate his masculinity, I guess. But one thing I was thinking, just to, maybe it's a little bit of a, a nuance um, to or a contrast of what, what Rob was saying is that it's interesting how while Tim Waltz, for example, clearly is you know expressing and perhaps a more sensitive version of masculinity, there is still this emphasis as well on him being a football coach, on him having been in the military. You know, I remember I watched the vice presidential debate and he emphasized the fact that he does have a gun. You know, Kamala Harris has a gun that they but like to hunt. That Kamala Harris said that she should be willing to shoot somebody if they if they broke into her house. So it's interesting, isn't it, that there are clearly these gendered confines that perhaps in some 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 subtle ways Waltz and Harris are challenging some of these gender norms, but at the same time also do feel like they still have to go along with them mm. and, and have to mm. be tough, have to be strong, have to be this commander-in-chief figure. And I guess perhaps for Kamala Harris in particular, that's that's really important, isn't it? Because we know that women in leadership positions, if anything, have to prove even more explicitly that they are able to still be tough, even though they're women kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I guess they'll also be aware that, you know, just how much the... Trump campaign is targeting mm. men and young men, you mm. know, so buying ads in the media with a, that men tend to consume, appearing on podcasts mm. with influencers, you know, who appeal to men, mm. showing up at, you know, fight clubs to, to cheering crowds, all, all of this stuff <laughs> yeah. that the Trump campaign are doing. They, mm. they have to try and counter that, you mm. know, and, and uh, address the, the male, particularly white male voters. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. But I did find it infusing, um, you know, that Rob reminded us about the fact that, you know, actually the majority of Americans do support abortion rights. And actually, I liked what he said that actually it's, it's a center left country. And you, I really don't think we mm. see it like that. But yeah, when you look at the voting that's going on there, you know, it is always the Democrats in recent years who have got the majority of the vote. It is only because of this antiquated electoral college system that it ends up being a fight over these few states. Mm. I thought it was also interesting, this very different point, you know, how he came to uh, be part of the movement, if you like. Mm, mm. You know, he was very um, powerful on, you know, the impact that fatherhood Mm. had had on him, you know, Mm. the notion of caring for another individual and what that opened up emotionally, you know, and I found that that, uh, moving. Mm. And also he made an interesting point about, how he came to to be interested in this work as well, didn't he? He, he said that you know, he had been working on environmental and anti nuclear um, campaigns and politics, and through that he became interested in in work with men. And mm. uh, I was just recalling that there was a book that we did a, a couple of years ago mm-hmm. now mm-hmm. with some colleagues, mm-hmm. which the name of which completely escapes me at the moment. But uh, I'm sure <laughs> you're men's activism to end violence against women. <laughs> Oh, yes, that's the one. Um, yeah, that book, we, we did have quite a few examples of men who said precisely the same thing, actually, that, that, uh, and that there is maybe a sort of transfer between, you know, different forms of activism and interest around, you know, um, masculinity politics and, and the environmental movement. 
Yeah. No, and I think in, in in Rob's book, it's very interesting about that, about how, you know, how the kind of pro-feminist movement kind of developed, you know, that it was, a lot of it was men who were involved in the anti-war movement, in the environmental movement in the States or in other countries, but who was were also very impacted by what feminists were saying and, and noticing the fact that there wasn't much reflection going on about men's own positionality or men's privilege or, or dominance within these, um, within these other uh, counter-cultural movements. So, um, yeah, it's really interesting. Right. Well, I think we should call it today, Stephen. I think because, you're right. Um, yes. My bed is calling, <laughs> and it's it's past midnight here now. <laughs> yes, my my bed's calling as well, even though it's only ten a.m. here. That, but I'm not used to getting up this early. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But yes. Well. Well, thank you so much, everybody, as always, for listening. Uh, do contact us at nowmen at gmail com. As we mentioned in the last episode, we do now have a Facebook page, facebook dot com slash nowandmen. Um, and yeah, we'll speak to you again soon. Yep. Look forward to speaking again soon. Take care. Bye. Bye now. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.